who are more inclined towards peace. Peace with their creator, peace with themselves, peace with their surroundings, than those who follow that way, that way of all the messengers of God, that way of submitting and surrendering yourself to the creator and not his creation. Now we're gonna be talking about a very important topic like we always do. When somebody takes that first step and they acknowledge that there is a supreme Lord, a sovereign, God that is ruling this universe, the Creator, and now they want to serve Him, they want to prostrate to Him, they want to worship Him alone. They take that necessary step, which is the Shahada, that first step. Many of us have come into this way of life consciously, but now what happens from here? What do you do from here? My next guest is going to help us tackle this topic. When we come back, my good friend Sheikh Yasser Qardi here on The Dean Show will be right back. Deen. Allah, there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa What did we just say? We just said, may peace be unto you. We have a lot of non-Muslims who are watching the show. Uh -huh. Every Wednesday here in Chicago, if you're in Chicago, they catch us at 12 midnight. And those who aren't staying up that late, then following day, 2 p.m. MashaAllah. They get great. to learn about what we just said, these little greetings. And the most important thing is, the way of life that we're trying to present to all of mankind, which is that way of all the messengers, Islam. Islam. Yeah. So now there are many people who are coming to this beautiful way of life, the fastest mm -hmm. growing way of life in the world today. But now they need some encouragement. What is the first step defining when somebody enters Islam, they declare, they make that declaration that there's no deity mm -hmm. worthy of worship except the creator of the heavens and earth. And mm -hmm. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, mm -hmm. accepting Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and all the other messengers that preceded him. What do they do from here? Let's spend a minute talking about what this word, what this phrase means, and then let's go on to the most important thing after that, the prayer, the establishment of the prayer. Okay. Um, well, one of the beautiful things about our religion of Islam is the emphasis on direct ritual and prayer to God directly. There is no intermediary, there are no superstitious rituals, uh, no strange incantations. It's very simple and very clear. If a person wants to accept Islam, they don't need to go to a church or a mosque or a synagogue. They can do so in the privacy of their houses, even though, of course, it's encouraged to publicize uh, the conversion. But the actual conversion is a declaration be before you and God. It's a declaration from, for, from the one, uh, basically, in front of the one who created you. You simply testify and you acknowledge that this creator is the only being and entity that is worthy of worship and veneration. It's that simple. And of course that testimony in Arabic is called the Shahada, uh, which basically translates as testimony. The very Shahada means it's a testimony. I am testifying, I am bearing witness, I am certain that there is no God that is worthy of my worship other than the one true God. And in Arabic, we call that God Allah. The Allah only means the true God. That's the meaning of Allah, is the God that is worthy of worship. So this testimony basically singles out that one entity for worship. And then we also testify that God has sent prophets and messengers. And that final prophet and messenger is our prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon all the prophets. So after this testimony of faith, a person is a Muslim. Whether he did so in front of a million people, 10 people, or no 
person, if he disowned the privacy of his house, if he testified, I bear witness that there is no God other than that one true God, Allah, and that God has sent prophets and messengers, and the final prophet and messenger is the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon all of them. That is what makes a Muslim a Muslim. Now, is Islam a new religion brought by Muhammad? Uh, Islam is the primordial religion. It is the original religion. And the meaning of Islam is submission. So it might have been manifested in slightly different ways in terms of practice, in terms of prohibitions, in terms of what you can or can't eat or how you dress or what you are. But the basic teachings and what we call theology, i.e. the belief in God, that does not change. So all the prophets came with the very same message, and that message was quite simple. Worship God, don't take any partners along with Him. That is the gist of Islam, and that gist has remained constant. It is eternal. Even before God created man, the same concepts were there, and that is that only He is worthy of worship. And even after there are no men on earth, those concepts will remain. So in that sense, Islam has been permanent. However, every prophet comes, and those prophets bring slightly different laws. The theology is the same, but laws can change from prophet to prophet. And this is, God takes circumstances and conditions and time and place into account. And so we do believe that prophets have come with slight variations in law, but not in theology. And so in that sense, Islam is slightly different from prophet to prophet, but that's only in legal sense, not in the theoretical or in the uh, theological sense. Okay, before we go on to <coughs> that next pillar, that establishment of the prayer, we want to just talk about this a little bit more. What's prevalent in the world today is that people, they say, okay, yeah, I believe in God, I believe in the Creator, but then you mentioned something about a partner. What do you mean that you don't want to put, that is probably the most, uh, that's the unforgivable sin, that if you die yeah. upon it, if you put a partner next to God, like what we see people mm -hmm. praying through uh, Jesus, for instance. Mm -hmm. What do we got to say about this? Well, from the uh, Muslim's perspective, there is only one God, and there are no partners, no entities that are worthy of any type of veneration or worship other than that true God. So Jesus Christ is a messenger of God. All of the prophets are messengers uh, that God has sent, and these prophets, they might be the best human beings, but they don't uh, impersonify God Himself. There is no element of divinity within them. So we believe that the greatest sin any human being can do is to deny this fact that only God is worthy of worship. And in fact, this is biblical teachings as well. The very first commandment is, you shall take no God other than the true God. This is the first biblical commandment as well, that you cannot worship any other God. And it is the same in our religion as well. The greatest sin, which is a greater sin than any sin you can do to a human being, is to transgress against God Himself. And to say to God basically in action, if not in speech, that you're not worthy of worship. This dead person is worthy of worship, or this idol is worthy of worship. I'm going to dedicate the most precious thing that I have, and that is my, my humility, my, my humbleness, my sacrifice, my prayer. I'm going to dedicate that to an entity that doesn't deserve it. And I'm going to worship a being that you have created. This is an insult and an affront to God. And that is why God has said He will not forgive this sin. Anybody who does so, knowing that there's one true God, and He dedicates His life to another God, even if He believes in the true God, but His worship is dedicated to another God, then this is what we call in, 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 in Arabic shirk, which means associating partners with God, and that's a type of polytheism. Now, problem comes, when you say the word polytheism in the English language, the only thing that comes to mind is idol worship. Yeah. That's the only thing that comes to mind. But it's, it's deeper than that. You don't have to have an idol to commit polytheism. You can, of course, you know, have an idol and be polytheistic, but you can be polytheistic without an idol as well. If you pray to a saint, if you pray to a dead person, if you prostrate out of respect and humility and worship to another created object, if you sacrifice, trying to please, like these pagan sacrifices, these ritual sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have human sacrifices in our religion, but we do sacrifice animals, right? We, we kill animals. Now when we kill an animal, we're allowed to kill an animal because God has told us. So when we kill an animal, we ritually sacrifice a cow or a sheep to eat it, we have to mention the name of the creator who created that animal. Because that's the creator that gave us that right to take that animal's life. Now if a person mentions another God, a person mentions another entity, that is dedicating a ritual to other than God, and that is polytheism. So let me define polytheism. Uh -huh. Polytheism is to give the rights uh -huh. of Allah to other than Allah, to give the rights of God to other than God. Anything that is due to God, if you give it to other than God, you are being polytheistic. 
Gotcha. Now, you mentioned blood and you mentioned sacrifice just to mm -hmm. emphasize this point. Now, that blood, God doesn't need, because some people feel that, okay, God sent his mm -hmm. son to die for the sins of the world. That blood sacrifice, that animal is for now what? For the poor? Yeah, is th this is a very, very different concept from Islam compared to other religions. Yeah. Uh, many religions have this concept that you do need to sacrifice uh, blood in order to you know, appease God. The Quran very clearly says, there's a verse in the Quran that clearly says, the blood and the meat does not reach God. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need this blood and the meat. Rather, what reaches God is your piety, yeah. is your dedication. Now, one of the ways to show dedication especially more in the past, is to show that this animal, you will sacrifice it for the sake of God. Meaning, what does it mean in our religion? It means you dedicate that meat to the poor. To the poor, okay. That's what it means. Yeah. Now, you've, you've God's shown, not hungry, he don't need he this animal. Need that at all. <laughs> okay. What you've done is you've shown that you're willing to spend money to take something very precious, whether mm -hmm. it's a cow or a sheep or a goat, and to use that money for people who need it, and that's the poor. That's what God likes. God doesn't need the blood and the meat. God wants to see your piety. Yeah. And that piety is shown by mentioning His name and thanking Him and then distributing that meat to the poor. And that is what we do every year uh, on the day of sacrifices called Eid al-Adha, the great, the grandest festival of the Muslims is on that day of sacrifice. And we're supposed to sacrifice an animal mentioning God's name. And we're supposed to give at least a portion of the mm -hmm. meat. We're allowed to eat a little bit, but we're give, supposed to give a portion of the meat to those who need it. That is what sacrifice entails in our religion. What you just said, I'm sure the truth seeker, the one who's really using his mm -hmm. mind and the good old common sense that God has given all of us, I just, it just makes sense. You don't have to jump through hoops, through a bunch of mental gymnastics Not to make it fit. So anybody who believes this mm -hmm. and he testifies to it with his lips and then his actions, that's what we want to go to now, the actions, mm -hmm. the prayer. You have many people who have submitted to this first step, mm -hmm. but now how do we encourage them? Because I've seen some people, mashallah, uh, all uh, thanks to the Creator, that they've come along quickly. Some people, it's been a few years they still have not established the five daily prayers. Yeah. Talk to us, Shri. Now that is definitely a major problem that uh, we are facing in our times, and that is Muslims believe in Islam, but unfortunately many of them don't really follow its injunctions fully. And one of the most, in fact, the fact of the matter, the most important injunction after the testimony of faith is the prayer. And it, the reason is very simple, and that is because the prayer is what shows you're constantly thinking and worshipping and thanking God. And that is why the prayer is a daily routine It's at specified intervals. There are five specific intervals that we're supposed to just stop everything. And the beauty of it, it's not an exact time at 12.02 we have to stop. No, it's always a range mm -hmm. between, let's say, 12.30 to 2.30, depending on the time of the year, where there are different timings. But there's two, three, four, five hours, a range. Within those hours, we're expected to stop what we're doing, Go into a corner, into a room, into a mosque. It doesn't matter. Anywhere, the whole world you can pray. You can pray in the park. And you just spend two, three, four minutes dedicated to Allah, to God. And that basically shows you're consistently thinking about God. You're consistently remembering that I'm a Muslim and need to pray. And the prayer is, there's no doubt, it is the most important principle of our religion after the testimony of faith. And that is what occurs in the very first verse in the Quran that those who establish the prayer, the very first chapter of the Qur'an praises those who establish the prayer. Surah Al-Baqarah, I mean, after yeah. the introduction. And our Prophet, peace be upon him, the very last phrases that he said before he died mm -hmm. is, I caution you about abandoning the prayer. Make sure you guard the prayer. Those were the last words before he died is that he wanted us to remember. So really, the prayer is a sign of your faith. Now you see, this is a, a key point here. Yeah. The word faith, when you say it in English, Primarily, the first thing that comes to mind is what you believe, theory. Yeah. It's intellectual. Mm -hmm. In Islam, it's not just intellectual. Faith is followed up by actions. Yes. Because the actions prove the faith exists. Mm -hmm. And that's, we know this in real life. When you love a person, you will give what you want, what that person wants. You will sacrifice to please that person. You will give up your time, your effort. You know, we're all married men here. We love our wives, we love our kids. Mm -hmm. You dedicate most of your day to taking care of their needs. Yeah. You sacrifice most of your paycheck for their needs. That's what you call love. Now, if you didn't, if there's a person who, you know, God forbid was a, a bad person, and he didn't take care of his wife, he didn't take care of his kids, it doesn't matter what he says, he does not love them. 
It's that simple, right? Actions speak louder than words. We all know that. So in Islam, there is no concept of faith being something that's hidden and theoretical. In Islam, faith is manifested in actions. There's no doubt that there's an, a theoretical element. I believe in God. I believe I have to pray. But if I don't follow it up in action, then there's a problem, isn't there? Yeah. So that action proves the true faith. And that is why the primary manifestation of faith in the life of the Muslim, the primary, not even, this is the primary manifestation, is the fact that he pray, he's praying five times a day. Mm -hmm. How can a person get to, because when you see and you talk to individuals, and I've had the experience mm -hmm. from talking to certain individuals, they're having issues, problems. The first question I ask usually is, are you establishing the prayer? And if a person isn't, I usually see that there's a problem here because if you're not mm -hmm. establishing the prayer, you're not connected with the exactly. Creator from up above. So, but on the other end, you'll see the same individual reading tons of book on how to be a successful businessman, mm -hmm. all worldly things, but they can't fathom, they can't imagine the idea that, okay, me praying five times a day is going to bring me this you know, peace and serenity, mm -hmm. and how do we deal with this? How do we tackle this? In fact, when a person establishes a, a relationship with God, when a person is constantly thinking about God, two things happen. Firstly, there's the issue of God Himself blessing that person. There's an undeniable fact. Mm -hmm. If you are a good person, God will give you blessings. Generally, by and large, those who are righteous and good people, they live better lives in terms of quality. Not necessarily quantity, yeah. you know, but in terms of enjoying their lives, right? And the second issue is, regardless of material, what you have and what you, not, what, what you don't have, internally, you feel a sense of peace, you feel a sense of, 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 of comfort, knowing that there's a God who cares about you and who loves you and who will bless you, if not in this world and the hereafter. So there's two elements, there's an external element and there's an internal element. And prayer and relationship with God, overall, even broader than prayer, is a relationship with God. Prayer is of course the most important manifestation of that relationship. Yeah. You can't have a relationship with God and not pray, it's that simple, right? Yeah. You can claim it as much as you want. If you don't pray as a Muslim, you don't have a relationship with God. So having a relationship with God, and in particular the prayer, what it does is it brings you a coolness of the heart, a comfort of the heart, makes you feel peace, at peace, because you are doing what you're supposed to do, which is the worship of God. And along with that, it brings about God's blessings as well. God will send upon you and shower upon you His mercy and His blessings, which is far more important than money or other material possessions. And you will start enjoying the quality of life, even if you don't have the quantity that other people have. And that's one of the biggest problems is that we judge happiness by quantity. No, it's by quality. Mm -hmm. And that is why our beloved Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, he said, the truly rich person is not the one who has lots of goods. It's the one who's content in what he has means he enjoys what God has given him and he loves the quality of life. He's content with what he has and he enjoys it. So if you have a thousand, ten thousand, a million, and you enjoy that amount and you have that, that, that quality, that is what will make you happy. Otherwise, if you're always greedy for more, the millionaire wants to become the billionaire, the billionaire wants to become the multi-billionaire, always greedy for more and more and more, that's not going to bring happiness. Mm -hmm. Quality versus quantity. Relationship with God will give you the quality. Now, does that come and fall back on what we said, that first pillar? That now, okay, I'm not worshiping Jesus. I'm not worshiping saints or going through saints. Okay, I'm, I'm not doing any of that. But mm -hmm. the call for prayer comes. And I can't get away from the TV or the music or this or that, something worldly. And this is all, it becomes an annoyance now. Mm -hmm. What do we got to say about this shit? That's definitely a problem. That's definitely a problem. There's a verse in the Quran that clearly describes the believers as those who their houses, their families, their, their, their livelihood, their businesses do not prevent them from worshiping God and establishing the prayer. They don't prevent them because if they do prevent, then there's another verse in the Quran, whoever falls sway to the desires of this world at the expense of the hereafter, that's the real loser because you've lost this world when you die and you've lost the hereafter after your death. The real loser, according to the Quran, You've lost this world and the next when you dedicate it to this world because when you die, what's going to happen? All of the goods that you have are out of your hand. doesn't matter how much you've amassed. You can't you take it with you? You can't take it with how you. How about that big, all the billions, millions, thousands? Your own, the people who bury you, uh -huh. they're going to be the ones fighting over it. The ones who supposedly love you the most, yeah. 
within the day that you die, they're going to be almost fist fist close <laughs> and fight over your millions and billions. That's the reality of life that we see around us. Now, someone also, okay, they come and they've been speaking the English language mm -hmm. all their life, and now they've got to learn all this Arabic, and they feel mm -hmm. like, okay, this is overbearing. How, how am I going to memorize all these new terms and terminologies to establish the prayer? They find it difficult. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Um, a number of things can be said here. First and foremost, the immediate... Uh, convert the person who converts uh, to Islam you know suppose somebody converts today so there's no doubt that you cannot memorize so much in in five seconds or five minutes next time the prayer comes along maybe two hours from now you're not expected to have all of this memorized you're allowed uh, for an interim until you memorize you're allowed to make do with translation make do with holding a paper and reading from it make do with saying you know praise be to god and just doing what you can for that particular day or two until you memorize the first chapter which is surah al-fatiha you memorize the key phrases and these should not take more than a day or two just to memorize the key phrases right so go to any muslim friend any mosque and they'll teach you these key phrases so within a few days you should have enough uh, to basically have the prayer done and slowly but surely you'll memorize more and more so that's the first point Take it easy and realize you don't have to start memorizing the entire Quran you know, today to, to start your prayer. It'll take a day or two. In that meantime, start learning how to pray, start learning the moves, start learning various phrases. The second point I want to say, the power of the Quran is really, really unimaginable because the Quran is the actual speech of God. So do not underestimate your capacity to memorize the Quran. You will see for yourself that after you read it a few times, it's going to stick in your head. Because it, it's got, I don't want to use the word magical qualities, mm -hmm. I'd say divine qualities. Yes. Because it's divine, it is divine. Mm -hmm. the, the Quran is the actual speech that God spoke. Yeah. Therefore, and you will notice this when you hear the Quran, and I challenge you right now, when you're, if you're watching this online, you know, uh, go to a, a website, YouTube, type in Quran recitation, and listen to the Quran in proper Arabic. You won't understand a word, but it will have an impact on you that you have never experienced in your life. Take it, take the challenge right now. And that is a proof that this is something that is divine. So do not underestimate your own capacity to memorize this foreign, strange language in Arabic. It will be easy for you because this is the speech of my God and your God. So they don't have to have a whole chapter memorized right away. They can do, like you said, the phrases, start the movements. Yeah, w the first day or two, of course, it's, they're not expected yeah. to have memorized Surah Al-Fatiha when they convert, you know. Yeah. Surah Al-Fatiha is the first surah, and it is an essential requirement of the prayer. Yeah. It's only seven lines, that's it, seven lines. It's pa one paragraph, that's mm -hmm. it. So, you know, the first time a, a person becomes a Muslim, suppose he converted at 10 a.m., yeah. then Dhuhr is gonna come in the first prayer in three, four hours. He's not expected to memorize that. So either he just says, you know, praise be to God or, you know, uh, all glory be to God, or he memorizes the English, you know, for that time, or he holds up the, the Arabic transliteration. It's simple. It's yeah, holds easy. it up in, the, in yeah. the prayer. So the point being, there is no difficulty in the religion. It's easy for you until you memorize. And when you memorize, then slowly but surely keep on adding a few more chapters as you go along, and things will be easy after that. So take one step at a time. Take one step at a time. Just yeah. like you took all them steps to finish exactly. and get that PhD. Exactly. Or get that high yeah. school diploma, whatever, GED, you took some whatever steps. Whatever happened, you had, to, you had to start from somewhere, didn't you? Yes. The famous saying uh, of Confucius, of a journey of a thousand miles uh -huh. begins with one, one, step. one step. That's the way you have to do it. Yeah. yeah. Now, okay, a few more points before we come to a close with my special friend Yasser Qadi. Tell us now, knowledge is key. Mm -hmm. You need knowledge back to what action. Again, you can read a ton of books on one side, mm -hmm. but when it comes down here to learning about your creator, how do we get people more focused on the other side, balancing it out? You don't have to obviously leave off this yeah. other good knowledge on how to become the best, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, scientist, doctor, lawyer, etc. but we want people to be more enthusiastic about seeking knowledge and the rewards of it. Yeah, this is a very important point, and knowledge has always been associated with our religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. From day one, the very first revelation that came down was to recite and to read. And this recitation came down upon a group of people who were absolutely illiterate. The Arabs did not even have a sophisticated writing system, that a very rudimentary system. And the first revelation that comes upon an unlettered, illiterate community, even our Prophet Muhammad could not read or write. And the first commandment is to recite and to read and to basically get some knowledge. That's the first commandment. And it was because of that that our, uh, the people of our religion, the Muslims, they took this commandment and they reached pinnacles that no other civilization ever reached before them in every single science because they were curious. 
whether it's religious science or secular science. Unfortunately, that spirit is very much destroyed in our times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people just don't have that enthusiasm that they do, even though it is a part of our religion to have that enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is being ignorant is something nobody likes. No. Nobody likes to be ignorant. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is an insult to be called ignorant. Why would you want to have this adjective describing you and the religion? Don't be ignorant of your religion. It's the most important science in the world. Why were you created? Why are you here? What are you doing with your life? What are you going to do after you die? What's going to happen after your death? These are fundamental questions that every human being has to think about and has to rationalize and, and, and come to a conclusion. And these days, it's so easy to find out what our religion and other religions say. These days, you just find out on the internet, go to the local library and get it straight from, you know, from the people, like we say in English, horse's mouth. Get it from the people who believe. Get it from the proper sources. And simply read some articles, listen to some lectures, do some, some research, and within the span of a few hours, you will educate yourself about the basic belief of Muslims, the basic belief of God, the hereafter, the Day of Judgment. It is essential, even just as a, as a, as a rational human being, that you understand what other people say and what other people believe in. And that's the first step to familiarize and to, to reach out and to you know, form neighborly connections. To basically, like you start off with the peace on earth, that's how we're going to have peace on earth, yeah. is to, to understand and to, 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 to sympathize and empathize with what we all believe in. Thank you very much for being with us again. My pleasure. Our good friend Sheikh Yasser Qadi, and we hope to see you back again on the Dean Show. Jazakallah May God Almighty Allah reward you for all your efforts and work. And thank you for coming back every week to see us here on the Dean Show. You don't know if you're going to live till tomorrow. <laughs> you have to find that urgency to do the right thing right now. Get connected with your Lord. Get connected with the one who gives you the air to breathe. Do the good that he's told you to do. And there's nothing less than paradise. That is what we're trying to achieve. And we'll see you back here next week. Every Wednesday at midnight. Thursdays 2 p.m. if you're here in Chicago. If you're not, you can catch us at thedeanshow.com where we have all of our shows there for free. We'll see you next time. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. One can never be too cautious. Hey. Man, I'm really sorry. Can I get you another drink? Hey! What a player! Man, you just got it all over my pants and my shoes, man. Man, I'm, I'm real sorry, man. Let me get you another cup. Man, I don't want another cup. You gotta watch where you're walking, man. Man, I'm sorry. I don't want any problems. I'm gonna get out of here, okay? Where are you gonna go? Man, please get your hands off me. What you gonna do about it? Nothing, you're ah! Let's go, man. Let's Are we do, okay man. Now, yeah, man. cool, cool, dude, man. Let go of my arm, man. Sorry, man. Yeah, I got you, man. Let's. Ah! I've had enough in your. Oh. One can never be too cautious. Hey, man, where'd you learn that? I trained you just at the Gracie Baja. You got time? I'll show you. Come on. Remember, these techniques is only for life-threatening situations, self-defense. Okay? Come on. What everyone's talking about. Prove. If you find one contradiction, it can't be from God. But the rational idea, the rational explanation is you do your best. Give up worshiping God is one. I will never give up spreading this message. The, the reality of life usually doesn't sink in until tragedy comes. You get a few bad people. The media grabs a hold of that and spins it the way they want to. If you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It is attended our faith to... You guys, let's look at the technique that we applied earlier. We call it a shoulder lock. It's going to be where the aggressor is going to place his arm onto my shoulder. Okay, there's two variations of this self-defense technique. One is if, just like so, the guy grabs you by the shoulder, but you notice the elbow is bent or loose. The second variation is going to be where the, he has my shoulder, but his arm is stiff. Okay, this is going to be another variation that we will not cover today. The one that we're going over is shoulder grab, bent arm. Okay, so how does he's going to place his hand on my shoulder? Now, I'm going to use the same side that he's controlling, I'm going to use that arm to come up and above his elbow. I come up and as soon as I get to this point now, I'm using his grip against him, okay? His grip, his wrist 
is secured tightly under my armpit. I'm going to go palm to palm. And now, making sure that his wrist is secured under my armpit, I'm going to start to raise his elbow up, applying the pressure onto his shoulder, okay? Let's take a look at that one more time. Same side he's attacking comes up and over the shoulder. At this point, I have to really focus on making his grip tight under my armpit. If the grip is loose, he's just going to pull his arm out, okay? Which gets rid of the grip. That can be another way of just disengaging. But we're going to try and take advantage of the situation, okay? He comes up. Come under the elbow. I go palm to palm. I secure his grip. And now I start to raise, elevate the elbow up. As I raise the elbow up, elbow up, trapping his wrist, that's where he starts to feel the pressure on the ligaments of his shoulder. Okay? And we saw one example of how to diffuse the situation with Jiu Jitsu. The beautiful thing about Jiu Jitsu is that you don't need to hurt, okay, punish the guy to diffuse the situation. If I decided earlier to punch or to kick the aggressor, I'm not diffusing the situation. I'm just increasing the chances of that becoming an extreme situation, a big headache, okay? One more time. Up, over, and now I have the option, maybe he's not in the best situation to now be an aggressor. I have him at my mercy at the moment. I can talk to him, I can defuse the situation. God forbid, if I need to really defend my life, there is the possibility of putting the tr pressure on the shoulder to do some real damage. But it should not come to that. Okay, we can talk, diffuse, and I feel that I'm, the situation is diffused, can let it go, and the situation is done without harming the aggressor. That's it for today's episode of the Self-Defense Workshop. Until next time, guys, be safe. It's cold, it's late. Everybody's sleeping I arise And ask a lot to forgive me Oh Allah you see Oh Allah you know All the sins I do I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart I'm your sinful slave, you're my loving Lord I'm the one who runs away, oh Allah guide me